Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. The attacks on 9-11 made us witnesses to a horror we never contemplated. And each year on the anniversary of that day, we mourn for the people and the innocence we lost. But increasingly, we seem to have different views of how to do that. I'd like to explore how people deal with grief. Seemingly, they do so in many different ways. My guest is Jill Vexler, the cultural anthropologist and happens to be a resident of Lower Manhattan. And I welcome you. Thank you. Good to you see you. You created a show at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. It's got a longer title, but I don't know. All right. In Lower Manhattan. Mm -hmm. About Yatzite and, and the, the whole Jewish law and how customs and have arisen and what they are. And I thought that would be a good place to start. It's a great place to start. And thank you for your invitation again. It's great to see you. What's interesting about the Museum of Jewish Heritage's decision to do an exhibition to commemorate the first yard site, right, the first anniversary of the attacks, is not just the content of the exhibition, it's the museum itself, its location, just a couple of blocks away mm -hmm. from what we now nicknamed Ground Zero. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was truly a witness. The building itself had the chief uh, supervisor not close the vents would have just been engulfed on the inside with this putrid smoke and ash. Mm. He saved millions of dollars in conservation costs by closing the vents. So the museum, in a way, Had its is own, a witness. Yeah. And of course all the staff yeah. who were there that day. Um, so the museum decided as really the preeminent downtown museum along with the Museum of the American Indian that with its mandate of commemoration, a living memorial to the Holocaust is the second part of the name, that commemoration and memory of this attack fit into its mission as well as any other mm -hmm. um, specifically Jewish event. So the idea was to look at how Jewish law and Jewish custom and Jewish community respond to loss. Grief is part of it. But I use a larger expanse, which is loss. What do you do when you lose something? How do your traditions, how do your beliefs, how do your laws, how do your neighbors, your organizations, your societies help you deal with this? And so that gave me the structure of an exhibition. Just in defining yeah, right. how do you deal with loss, we, we explored these many avenues. So what, what, tell me, how do we deal with loss? Well, the title of the exhibition really gave me the initial structure, yard site, year time. And I thought of it that's as... What it's, that's what it stands. That's it's what it means. German, Yiddish, yeah. year, yard site, uh -huh. time. So that every year, you, on the anniversary of a death, right. thinking of a human's death, in this case, the anniversary of loss of innocence, the anniversary of loss of the buildings, of loss of 3,000 people, you stop and you reflect. So I picked up the phone and called about 25 or 30 rabbis and professors of Jewish studies and said, essentially, give me your shoot from the hip definition of yard site. And it was really quite a stunning array of responses. But the one that stuck with me the most, or several stuck with me, but one of them was from um, a rabbi who basically said, don't think of yard site as a frozen moment each year. Don't think of it as a reflection only. Think of it as both a reflection toward the past and a vision of the future. How did what I learned from that person, in this case, how did what I learned from the events of September 11th, teach me something that I will take into the future? So that yard site is at once this Janus-faced image, a custom, that sends you to the past and urges you into the future. And what's interesting and prompted by our conversation yesterday, I began to look a little more into Islamic mourning. And there's something very much in the Quran that's precisely about that. There is no day of mourning. In fact, it's forbidden to go to an Islamic cemetery, a Muslim cemetery on the anniversary of a death. But on the anniversary of a death, or as you look at someone you loved and lost, you take that person's teachings into the future. So it's very much a present. It's with you all the time, and you are, in a, in a way, the future. So that gave me the structure so that while we were, I was looking back, I was also saying, well, what did Jews do to rebuild? 
And as many of the rabbis, and of course, you don't have to be a rabbi to know that, but it's almost in the Jewish DNA, as Rabbi Rubenstein of, of uh, Central Synagogue said, it's almost in your DNA to know you have to rebuild. The temple's destroyed, you rebuild it. The temple's destroyed again, you may not rebuild it, but you rebuild Something. the meaning of it. And so that's a very Jewish response, um, not uniquely Jewish, but certainly as a Jewish museum, that was our take on it. So it's very interesting because, of course, then the plan, the discussion on what do you do on the site, the, the dispute about making it a park and a permanent memory of, of frozen time as opposed to redeveloping and building it, bringing life back to it. Well, I don't Can think the reflective that? park, kind of non-cultural space, is de facto not filled with life. True. It, it's at once reflective, it's sad, and it's, okay, what am I going to do about it? But that's what each individual brings. And one of the things that I found so fascinating about the yard site exhibition at a Jewish museum that really deals with the Holocaust in its principal mission um, is that students who came in who may know nothing about Jewish life, folklore, history, religious beliefs, who may know nothing about 1933 to 1945, do know or did know about September 11th. It was the one thing we all shared. So as a point of departure saying, this is what the Jewish culture does. What does your culture do? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're Irish Catholic, you have wakes. Oh, you're Mexican, you have Dia de los Muertos. You, <laughs> what do you do? And so that's what I think museums are good at mm -hmm. in, in posing something and you never know who's going to walk into your doors. And so, so this, and what they learn. Yeah. Right, and what they learn. So, what did, so what was the exhibit? Well, it was basically a minimalist show. We mm -hmm. weren't into any bombastic right. crushed cars as centerpieces. People had seen that. We almost had no photographs. People had seen it. It was very nuanced and I think very poignant in the selection of the artifacts, which I'm, I'm very proud of and I, and I love the design of the show. It was very elegant. And, and one of the examples that I love is in the course of interviewing people and the whole cathartic opportunity to grieve out loud to this person who wasn't a therapist, I'm not a therapist, yeah. but yeah. I had a kind of a therapeutic role. Yeah. And I was truly the anthropologist as ghost writer because I was going to tell these people stories in this thing called an exhibition. And people were dying to talk. The generosity was mm. extraordinary. But one of my favorites was the young man who was the manager of the New Balance footwear store in the lower level of the World Trade Center. And he talked and he talked, we must have talked for an hour and a half. And at the end he said, I left so fast, I, um, I grabbed the key and didn't lock the door. <laughs> and he talked and talked and at the end of it I said, do you have the key? And he said, sure I have it. And I said, may I, may I borrow the key for, for the, the exhibition? Exhibit. So in this little Lucite box is a key <laughs> from New and a story representative of hundreds of That's businesses that were destroyed, right. hundreds, and livelihoods, and, and things like that. So I, I felt that it was rather nuanced. A, a woman I interviewed from one of the Jewish newspapers said that they lived downtown. I wanted people who lived all over the city, of course, and someone who lived in Battery Park said we were allowed to go back in for 10 minutes. My husband ran up 10 flights of stairs, and he brought his cell phone and his talus. And she said, had my great-grandfather had a cell phone, he might have brought it, but he brought his talus when he fled, right. wherever he fled. And so, this, so it was in that moment, there was this real Jewish continuity. And I think that that's part of loss. Part of dealing with loss is, well, how do I continue? What is continuity? And so when you have the structure of a custom, customs are freewheeling in a way, but custer, customs compel you. You have to do something. Why do you do it? Why do you do it? Why do you do it every year? Isn't it kind of redundant? No, it's a reminder. It's not redundant. It's different each year, but this it compels you to deal with it. And there are no easy outs with loss. There are no easy outs, but community helps, faith helps, history helps, and knowing that other people have gotten through it also helps. 
So all of these collective elements of Jewish culture, philosophy, religiosity, folklore, all of these things helped get people through it. And I would posit that every culture represented in the World Trade Center losses has something analogous. And that would be a phenomenal uh, cross-cultural right. study to do. Did you have something about the future in the exhibit? How did you Well, we ended that? the exhibition because the room it was in is the most beautiful room in any <laughs> museum because it's this glass wall looking out at the Statue of Liberty. You could just stop right there. But we did end with some quotations about rebuilding, that it is very much part of Jewish culture to rebuild. You mourn in the moment. You mourn deeply. You grieve. No one says, no one's got a stopwatch saying it's time to stop grieving. But you must rebuild. And so we, we had that and so, then elements so from the... What other cultures do you know of that, that were involved in the world in 9-11? Well, I certainly was in, somewhat involved in the Mexican yeah. culture because that's my, yeah. my, my home and culture. We had, and there were a lot of people there from Mexico, well, we they, think. Exactly. And that's the most stunning thing about that, huh? Yes. And, and I was at the, at the Mexican consulate a great deal at yeah. the time. Um, Arturo Sarujan, who was the consul general then, who's now the ambassador in Washington, who's a dear friend of mine, uh, was extraordinarily helpful to people who, who couldn't find their families or, or families who couldn't find their loved ones. And the problem, of course, with being undocumented is that you were often not on payroll. Were they mostly from the restaurants in, yes. the, in the building? Restaurants and um, from the delis. A lot so of how the would they, men. how do they respond now? Well, many left. Yeah. It was one of the great exoduses of Mexican, it was emigration from the New York area. So what's uh, the cultural thing back. in Mexico responding to loss? Well, I love to talk about Day of the <laughs> Dead. I can talk about that for hours and months. Um, <laughs> it's November 1st and 2nd, and it's the kind of formal quality, formal occasion within the Catholic religious calendar, All Saints Day and All Souls Day. Uh, for everybody, but a division being made for children who haven't been baptized yet, mm -hmm. called Los Angelitos. And, and there, was, there were very much altars and what, of course, spontaneously happened all over Lower Manhattan, we can look at Union Square in particular, were all these altars that came up. Mm. It could be a tree. It could be a lamppost. It didn't mean that the person who died had anything to do with that, but they were missing. There were the missing uh, uh, posters and then mm. candles. And, and so as I collected things for the exhibition, one of my favorites is just a, a used candle very poignant, one of those little blue Jewish candles um, that had been burnt and someone left it. But then some museum per curator picked it up. But, but <laughs> that, that idea. So, so certainly the Mexicans were, were very much in, in, in calling on their, on their Catholic and some indigenous roots, culture, cultural um, practices to, to deal with that. But the Mexican Catholics are different from well, Dave, well, certainly. Oh, certainly. In the aesthetics and in the, yeah. the, the calendar is the same. The name of the holiday is the same. But the aesthetics and the manifestation of it is dramatically different. My, my, uh, my take, in a sense, on Day of the Dead without September 11th in the background, um, which would only be six weeks difference, is that it's around harvest time. So in a Mexican indigenous context, Day of the Dead is very much Thanksgiving. You're going home, but you've also got extra hands to help harvest. And it's a great feasting time. Uh, it's a time to clean up the cemeteries, which is what you see in all the marvelous mm -hmm. photographs. But it's nonstop eating. And the <laughs> preparations for it are two weeks. The celebration of it's two days. And the recovery is Does the weeks. Mexican community celebrate 9-11 uh, in, a, in a different way? Do they, do they notice it in Mexico? Do you know? I don't think that there, I don't know of any yeah. formal recognition. Yeah. So it. let's go now to how we, we honor that day. Um, do you ha what do you think? Well, of course, this year it was enormously charged. It was. Well, yeah, let's put that f to talk about later. Okay. But yeah. um, it's, it seems to me that it's, and, and I don't mean this in any kind of a poor way or anything, 
but it's celebrated as individual loss and not a collective sense of loss. I don't know why I think that. But how can it sustain that, the vastness that it had the first year or two? How can it really sustain it? No, I'm not talking about your exhibit. Now I'm talking no. about today. No, no, yeah. no. I mean, how oh. can that collective grieving right. happen nine well, years it, later? Because politically, of course, it went into a war. Definitely. So it, there's nothing about grieving at that point. It's about who's and, right. It's a, it's yeah. And what's the right way it's to retribution grieve? Retribution. What's the right way to grieve? There is no right way to grieve. What's the right way to honor someone? There is no right way or wrong way. Yeah. It's highly individual. And so I think the decision making, not only around the memorial itself, is extraordinarily complicated. But of course, we'll talk about the mosque later. But <laughs> but how do New Yorkers? collectively have that shock again. I'm almost glad we don't. People were walking around numb for months and months, which is in a way part of the generosity I felt because people were dying to do everything right. for They were you. so helpful and we lost that spirit. Yes. Yeah. And, and of course that's emphasized by what's happening now with the, mo with the community center. Right. We have to be really the careful. Community center. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. We, we nicknamed it the MCC, the Muslim Cultural Center. Okay, right. the MCC. So, but it, it, it's true, it's, it's, it's totally lost, the source, because we've had nine years of distorting Islam. We've had nine years of this bizarre xenophobia. Right. Call it Islamophobia, it's more extensive than Islamophobia. It's every kind of nuanced xenophobia you can think of. And yet, the moment you give it a locus, you give it this physical place, suddenly people talk about holiness and holy ground. What? What is it? Is what there is such holy? a thing as hallowed ground? Hallowed ground is the ground on which a church is, isn't it? If you, once it is sanctified with To the certain, people who belong to, to, to that church. Exactly. Right, which is why it's so easy to shrug off someone else's because it's not wasn't sanctified with your laws and your language and your your prayers. So do you think that people who don't call the 9-11 site hallowed ground are, are throwing off somebody else's or are the people who think it's <laughs> hallowed ground imposing their restrictions on everybody else? Do you know what I'm saying? I, I do. I, I, think, I think it's a continuum. Yeah. You know, it's just the range. Yeah. And if you lost someone personally, you're still grieving the loss, not only how the person died, just that the right. person died. And, and all the yard site comforting, all the responses, all of that may mollify a little, but you're still raw to a certain point. Um, and I think that, that the rawness was part of the eloquence that I heard from everyone, from a delivery man whom I interviewed in Spanish to, to a psychiatrist who was interviewing policemen who were traumatized, firemen who were traumatized. Uh, there was a certain eloquence in that rawness, I call it. Um, so that's going to be the continuum. And so for some people it's holy, for other people it's not. But what it certainly is is historic. What it certainly is is multicultural. What it certainly is is multi-religious, international, and a site that should be visited for its power of learning how not to deal with conflict. But we haven't learned that. No, but can <laughs> now let's a talk museum about the community there center. spark it? Yeah. Can the MCC, the Muslim community? Well, well I think uh, the community Cordoba. center that has provisions for all different religions certainly is a very good answer to that. Of course, so the question is why do people because they de don't, facto. Because they don't understand it and I think they're being whipped up, don't you think, by oh, sure. people who just, why do, what do they want, these people who are whipping this up? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's one of the most negative features of the United States. It's the most odious conundrum I've ever had to try to unravel. And I think about it a lot because it is so antithetical to everything I was brought up with in a, in a home setting, in an academic setting, in a theological, yeah. religious setting. Right. In an ethical setting, it's just unthinkable. And it's the most anti-American, ugly response I can imagine. What are they gaining? I don't know. So the response, though, started, as you said before, with the fear of basically Islam, right? 
It's fear of other. Yeah, and with the war in Iraq. Right. And and that whole the war in Afghanistan started first, though. Right. Yeah. But we sent the soldiers first, our forces first to Iraq, right? In large numbers. I don't know, right. but it gets too complicated, mm -hmm. and you know more than I do about it. But, <laughs> but instead of mourning in a positive way, we mourned in a revenge. Well, there's that piece of revenge also in Judaism, which I'm not thrilled about, uh, but which I see, you know, may, you know, there are injunctions after the name of the loss of someone who has been murdered. Instead of may he rest in peace or may she rest in peace, it's may his or her name be avenged. I've seen this in reference mm -hmm. to the rabbi who was killed in Mumbai in the terrorist attack, which was clearly anti-Semitic. Right. Um, but in general, that's not the Jewish take. Right. It's rare. It's how do we build a bridge? And how do we respond to others as we wanted people to respond to us? I mean, it was, it's, it's, it's almost elementary. It's almost elementary that, that 200 years ago, a Catholic church could not be built in Lower Manhattan. And which two churches survived? St. Paul's and St. Right. Peter's. They were not allowed to be built. And Peter Stuyvesant didn't want synagogues to be built. We changed. How can we repeat those silly errors? But we do. So. Now that's your responsibility, isn't it? <laughs> we work <laughs> on it. As an anthropologist. To understand why we repeat them? Well, is it a mixture of historical anthropology? I mean, is anthropology is a historical. Well, of course. In, in nature, right? Of course. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's, it's the most, you know, it's one of the, these trends. It's the most human response to tell a story. We retell, we retell, we retell. Well, now we know psychologically it's healthy to retell. No one put it in those terms thousands of years ago when folk tales were getting going. Folk tales which have become law, folk tales which have become <laughs> habit, habit yeah, right, yeah. or belief, yeah. um, sometimes law, I suppose. Um, and I think it is very much a part of human nature that some of us will doubt, some of us will hate, and some of us will never give the other guy a chance. I love the point, we're almost at the end of this half hour, which is terrible, but I love the point with St. Peter's and St. Paul's and the churches that were not welcomed earlier on. Where? And then everybody's surprised that, in fact, there was a mosque in the Trade Center. Right, and that at the <laughs> Pentagon right this second, yeah, right. There there's is still a mosque. a mosque where Muslim employees of the Pentagon pray every day. So what's the problem? So why historically? So we, can't, we need another half hour to fit in. And we need to bring in those people who have the irrational hatred and try to quell it. And I think that one-on-one -on -one exposure is the way to do it. You have to confront your fears and find out that the common humanity, as trite as that s sentence has become, really is the basis. But that's what they say they want to have happen at the Cordoba Center. Of course it is. And so those who oppose it don't seem to understand that that truly can happen in something. And Cordoba is an amazing place. You go to Spain right now and you say, my God, I wish I were there 500 years ago. It would have been the most spectacular, the golden age Tell of Spain. Tell us about the city. Oh, Cordoba, first of all, is exquisitely gorgeous. It was truly the, 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 the alchemy in the best sense of the word, the chemistry of cross-cultural fertilization among Jews, Muslims, and Christians. It was a philosophical, intellectual, scientific, poetry, humanities center. The architecture is beyond belief, and it lasted for a long time. And so Cordova... And a time by, also where you didn't have communities like that in other places, or did no, you? No, it was unique. It was unique in Europe. And southern Spain was just this fantastic, fertile um, cultural area. And, and it lasted for hundreds of years. But what destroyed Cordova was the desire to make Spain uniquely Catholic. So the expulsion of the Muslims and the Jews. The Jews flee to north to Spain and south to North Africa, and the Muslims go to what are now predominantly Muslim countries. And what happens to Spain? They wreck their economy, they wreck their intellectual life, the great universities of the world crumble, 
and Spain goes out hunting for new sources of wealth and explore the new world, bingo, Mexico, Peru. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, but it could have lasted, and it did last. And I think the selection of the word, the name Cordoba is brilliant, so, yeah. brilliant. Because it's a time we can aspire to, it's a time we can emulate, and we have to understand it. And now people have distorted Cordoba as calling it a place yes. where Muslims right. squash Jews. Inaccurate, right. totally inaccurate, cheap shot. <laughs> so it is a great inspiration. It is. Oh, all of Southern and Spain. And what a wonderful way it would be to commemorate what happened on 9-11, right? Yes, yes. And, and to of course... To bring everybody together. <laughs> yes, and of course there are many other religions represented there. I mean, there were Sikhs who died. There were, there were yeah, of course, well, Buddhists and, and, and Hindus who died. And there were people who didn't believe in God at all who died. So ah, why not have this setting? And who cares what, what name it is? Create a place where people meet right. and where we have an opportunity really to get to know our Muslim neighbors. That's very good. Thank you so much, Jill Thank Dexler. You. It's always so interesting you. to have you. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.